Good morning, everyone. I welcome you today. Thank you for being here. Thanks, thank you to those of you who are online with us today. We love you. If you're a guest, thanks for coming. We're so humbled and honored that you've chosen to come worship with us this morning. Well, it is hot. That is like an understatement of the century, right? It's so hot. And I was just thinking this morning, thank the Lord. I think we should do this. Thank the Lord for air conditioning. Amen, right? And thank the Lord for the guys that fixed ours here at EVC this past week because it's been hot in here the last several weeks. So thank you for uh, enduring that and coming back if you've endured it with us. And so, well, we're dealing with the heat, but other places around our nation are dealing with storms. And in fact, there's a rare storm that is uh, kind of rolling through the, uh, the, the uh, southern part of California. And uh, that's really rare that that happens there. But nobody knows more about hurricanes and storms, I think, in our country than the people who live on the Gulf Coast. Those folks that live in that area. And there's a man by the name of Dr. LeBron Lackey and his uncle, Russell King, who decided they wanted to build, they bought some property on Mexico Beach in Florida there, and they decided they, want to, they wanted to build a home that would last, a home that would survive in their words, and there was an interview that they did, the big one, when the big one comes through, and they wanted a home that not only they would enjoy, but their kids would enjoy, uh, they went in together on this, their grandkids could enjoy this, in fact, they said, we wanted a home that would, that would be a legacy home for, for our family to enjoy throughout the years. And so as they consulted with their architects about how to do this, there are certain codes and specs that uh, Florida has for building homes in certain areas. And, uh, and, and so they said, we, we want to we build a home that's going to survive the big one, so how do we do that? And so these are pilings, okay? And these pilings go down into the foundation of the ground there. They go deep. And so they asked the, the, the architects, what do we need for our storm to be able to make it through a big, you know, our house to be able to make it through a big storm? And, well, they said, you want to have at least 30 feet, 30 feet of pilings there. You want them to go down deep. And so they said, make ours 40. We're, we're going to go above that. We, we want ours to be 40. And so what you see is 12 feet above the ground and 28 feet below the ground that go deep down into the foundation to provide this, this stable home. And they, they also, uh, they said, well, how do we make it uh, resist the winds that are going to be coming? And code in that part of Florida is for the windows to be able to survive and everything else. It, it should be able to survive 120 mile per hour winds. you got to build it to their certain specs. They built theirs to withstand 250 mile per hour winds. And when they were asked about this, they were being interviewed about this, and a lot of architects interviewed them, um, it did cost more. They would say that it cost them somewhere between 20 and 30 percent more to build a house like this. They kind of, they kind of had some people that were like, you're, but you're right on the coast. You want more windows than what you have. I mean, you want to be able to see everything. And they said, we definitely have windows. We want windows. And we're going to have a, a, a nice, beautiful home. But what they were most concerned with was not just the outward appearance of the home that was on the coast there. Um, what they're most concerned with was its ability to last. Its ability to survive storms because what we know is storms happen. Right? Storms are going to happen. Now, we are concluding this series today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 7. And we are, we are reading these words of Jesus. And Jesus in Matthew 7, we've been looking at his conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And I hope you've gone and you've read the Sermon on the Mount on your own. It's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And Jesus spent a great deal of time really talking about what it looks like to live a life with God as your king. The kingdom of God is what Jesus was saying is at hand. And he would say at the very conclusion, there are two kinds of people that are in, he would say, in, in the audience today. He would say there are, there are two gates and two roads and people have a choice to make about which road they're going to travel in this life. And then he said, and we looked at this last week, there are two kinds of trees. There are those that, that bear fruit, and then there are those that, that may say a lot about, you know, what they know about God, and maybe they know some things about God, but they don't bear any fruit in their lives. And that fruit was directly related to the things that he said in the Sermon on the Mount. 
In other words, they li- these people live this out in their lives. And then Jesus is going to say, as they are just in awe of his teaching, he is going to conclude this by saying there are two kinds of builders who are in this place, which means there are two kinds of foundations. And these are the very last words of the Sermon on the Mount. Class is about to be dismissed. People are about to walk back down the hill into their everyday life, into their villages, going back to their jobs. And what Jesus is saying is, I want you to understand that you have a choice. You have a choice about what you just heard, what you're going to do with that. Jesus is making a dramatic point, and he has their, he has their attention. Maybe you're new here today. Let me, let me just give you, uh, just catch you up, give you a little context. In Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the masses were coming to Jesus. Crowds were coming and crowding all around him. They wanted to be around him for, a, for various reasons. Some were looking for a miracle and healing. Some had heard that he was an incredible teacher, which he is. Some were saying, we're just wondering if he's the Messiah, right? Is he the one who is going to lead us uh, uh, out of this uh, oppression of Rome? They were wondering, and so people were coming from everywhere. Jesus seizes this moment, and he begins to, to ascend up on this hillside. This hillside, um, let's, let's roll that if we have that. You can kind of see that's what the hillside, it's called the Mount of Beatitude. And Jesus would begin to ascend up on this hill and he would sit down. And it's in northern Israel. It's a beautiful part of Israel right next to the Sea of Galilee. So there was this beautiful setting. People were looking out. They were, Jesus, because of the masterful teacher that he is, is incorporating all kinds of elements of nature and illustrations that people could deeply relate to. And he had their attention. And he is talking about, as he concludes, and he is just about to make his mic drop moment, he said, you're about to walk back down this hill. And you're about to go back into your lives. And there are two kinds of people. And he says there are two builders who are building two kinds of foundations. And he's saying, I want you to understand, I've just given you a lot of information, but you have a choice And he's saying, I'm giving you information, but what I want you to know that I'm looking for is transformation. You can hear this information, but what I'm wanting you to do is to make a decision about what you have just heard. And it's going to impact not only you, it's going to impact your family. It's going to impact the legacy that is coming up behind you as you're seeking to build a home. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, this is what Jesus says, anyone... Who listens or hears my teaching is what he's saying and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock or bedrock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were, what does it say? Amazed. Another word is astonished. They were in awe of his teaching. And this is the reason, right? It says, for he taught with real authority. He taught with this power that was life transforming if applied. And it was unlike, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. What Jesus had been talking about is this big difference of what relationship with God is as we are created in that sense to walk in relationship with God versus what it just looks like to have religion in your life and going through the motions of religious activities. And Jesus is saying is that you have the kind of intimacy with God the Father that begins to translate not only vertically your life with God, but it also impacts horizontally your relationships with others. And that's why he's going to say some very challenging things in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, okay, in the conclusion, you've heard my words. All of you have heard this teaching. And I want you to take them seriously is what he's telling those who are in his audience. You have a choice to make as you walk down this hill. You can either just have a lot of information and download information and just take a lot of sermon notes 
or when you go back into your villages, when you go back into your relationships and your family, when you go back to your job, you can begin to experience transformation because you're putting my words into practice. They're beginning to have an impact upon you. You do something with this. And I envision as Jesus is concluding, the crowd is thinning. They're beginning to go back down the hill. And I can see this one guy, maybe, who comes up to him. And he's just like, oh, my goodness. That was the most awesome thing I've ever heard. That was so powerful. I admire your teaching so much. Jesus, I got so many quotes that I am going to tweet and that I'm going to post on Facebook that I'm hoping it's going to get a lot of likes. I mean, I got some stuff that you said is powerful. Thank you. I admire you so much as a teacher. And I imagine if a scenario like that unfolded, Jesus would say, well, I really appreciate your kind words, but I want you to understand that I'm not looking for admirers. What I am looking for, I'm looking for followers. I'm looking for those who, I'm not seeking to build a crowd because it's easy to build a crowd. And by the way, as we've been saying every week, that the crowds would follow Jesus and the words of Jesus would have an interesting way of thinning out the crowd. Because Jesus would say some things that were oftentimes difficult to hear because it would cost up front. There was a cost that Jesus would say to discipleship. And discipleship means to become like Christ, to live like Christ, to have Christ as your Lord. Salvation, we believe, is free by God's grace. Amen. I praise God for that. But here is what he's saying. Discipleship costs you your life. To begin to look like me, to walk like me. And so I see Jesus is saying to this crowd what I'm looking for. And what he's saying maybe to this man in a conversation that's hypothetical, okay, in my mind. Is he saying, I'm looking for followers. I'm looking not just for listeners and hearers. That's easy to to have. What I'm looking for is those who will apply and who will become doers of the word. Those who will put their faith into practice. That's why Jesus will use this contrast and compare imagery over and over with two gates, two trees. He'll talk about sheep and wolves, and you know, those we talked about that last week. And he'll use this compare and contrast because what he's saying is there's two kinds of people those that will take the words and do something with them, and then there are those who just listen to the words and they may like it, they may just be indifferent about it, or they may just procrastinate. And Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, I am appealing to you to do something with what I have said to you today because it will change your life. It will give you a foundation. Jesus knew that that these words of his would transform their lives, which would eventually transform their behaviors, which would impact their families, which would impact their legacy. This is what Jesus is getting at. And people were walking down the hill. They were reflecting upon this. And I want you to know, He had just said, you're going to experience two kinds of people, and you're all going to experience a storm at some point in your life. And I think we all know this. 2,000 years later, the words still ring true today. And there are some of you who are here today that as we talk about storms, and my heart was just thinking, I was thinking much of you yesterday as my I prepare myself just praying on Saturdays, praying throughout the week, but really getting my heart ready, being sure I'm ready to to talk with you and to share with you transparently and, and just to share my heart with you. And I know that there are some of you who are right in the middle of a storm, a storm that you never saw coming. And it's, man, it's battering you right now. It's, it's, it's a rough season that you are in or somebody that you love is in a difficult storm. And there are all kinds of storms, right? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But Jesus says the storms are going to come and there are two kinds of people who will be in that crowd and who will be in that storm. Now, here's the deal. I, I, I really know nothing about construction. A number of you do. And, uh, and so as we talk about construction things, you could easily be like, man, he doesn't know anything, okay? Because some of you, you know me, and you know me that I am not good at working with my hands. When things break around my house, I try. I really do. It's admirable that I try. I mean, so, but here is what I typically do. I make things worse. 
and I break them worse than they already are, and so I'm not great at working with my hands. The only thing I'm good with my hands is picking up my phone and saying, Dad, I need you to help me, all right? Because my dad is a guy who is great at working with his hands and can fix anything and build anything. So is my brother-in-law, Dustin. And I call those guys, and I'm like, I need help, and I, need to, I try to learn, and right, and then I typically make it worse. Now, you may be like, man, Bart doesn't know anything about construction, and you would be right. But what I want you to know is Jesus does know about construction. Jesus knows about construction because he grew up in the home of a, a carpenter. Okay, now that word carpenter, it's not just that he crafted maybe, um, he maybe crafted some chairs or tables and he maybe did do some of that. But the word also, it translates like this, stonemason, that, that he was a builder. And sons would be in the trade of their fathers. That's kind of what happened and they would carry that family business on so it is not, it wouldn't be, a, you know, a stretch to say that even in the crowd that was listening to Jesus, that perhaps he and Joseph had been involved in building some of their homes, building some of those things. Now, I can't prove that, but it's just, it's, it's possible, okay? But we do know this, that Jesus understood construction, and he understood that people would have under, he used all kinds of images to, to get people's attention. And so as Jesus begins to talk about this, he's going to show us that there are some comparisons and contrasts to the two kinds of people, the two kinds of builders, and I think you'll see this very clearly in the Word of God, the two builders have some things in common. Here's some good things to write down. Both builders had the same dream. Both builders, there were two builders, right, wanted to build a home, a life. They wanted to build something. Neither one of them went in just thinking, I hope it just kind of lasts. You want something to last, right? You want your home to be maybe even a legacy. That if your kids don't want it, at least you could sell it and they would, you know what I mean? You want it to last. And so both of these builders had the same dream, which was to build something that was significant. We all want our lives to matter. We want our, our lives to be significant. We want our faith to matter. We, want, we are all seeking, the, Jesus knew this about his crowd, we're all seeking that same thing. Jesus had started the Sermon on the Mount by saying, can I tell you essentially how to live a blessed and happy and solid kind of life? And, the, and everybody wants to know about that. But he was going to tell them things that was going to be completely upside down from what they had been hearing. And it was going to rock their world because it was going to be opposite of what the world says will bring you foundation and happiness and satisfaction. And so these two builders both had the same dream, okay? And, and we can relate to this. Both builders also had, had heard the same message, Jesus is saying, there are people who are in the crowd and you're hearing me. These who have heard my message, who are listening to me, they both heard the word. And I want you to think about this. They heard this divine truth from the greatest teacher that has ever lived. God himself incarnate was their teacher on that hillside that day. And they are hearing his words and they are captivated. It says they were astonished at the end. It says that it says they were blown away. Okay, and and I, and in in the message that Eugene Peterson, the paraphrase, it says they, it was like a standing ovation. And I can kind of envision that. And everybody is applauding. They're blown away by what they have heard. And so they both have heard the same message. These builders but they have a choice with what they're going to do with what they heard as they walk down the hill. And you have a choice with what you're going to do. I always want to say this, especially if you're new. I want to point you to Jesus' words. My, my words are inadequate, okay? I'm just a flawed person. But I want to point you to the word of God because his words is what is rock solid. And you have a choice to do. To, you know, to reconcile your choice with what you're going to do as you walk out the doors and you walk back to your job or you go back to your community or you go back into your home. What do I do with what I have heard? All right, so you have this, these builders also. Here's the other common thing. Both builders face the same storm. 
they both were in the storm. Jesus didn't say just because one had a rock-solid foundation, he's going to get to live a storm-proof life, or a storm-free life, I should say. He didn't say that. He essentially said there are these There are these two guys, and I envision the first guy, okay, that Jesus is talking about. He's going to, he picks the place that he's going to build his home, and he he begins to look at the landscape, and and he begins to do probably something that is going to cost him more time and effort and energy instead of just building it on the dirt up on top. He digs down, and he gets to, and the way that it translates is bedrock, Bedrock. We, if you dig anywhere around here, you know we got some bedrock, okay? And, uh, and, and, and that is true about this plot of land right here, okay? There is this bedrock. But it costs more time up front. It costs more energy. It even might cost more money because it's longer labor. And, uh, but this guy had to dig down deep to get to the solid foundation To be able to have a a life or a home that would last, one that would last, I want to tell you this, and Jesus will say this over and over again if you read the Gospels, it will cost you, it will cost you up front to build a house on rock. All right, so there's one guy who's doing that, that, that job of digging down deep, and then I think of the other guy. He also probably looks at the landscape, and he has the same dream. I want to build a nice home for my family. I want to build something good. I mean, he he was going to spend a a lot of the same kind of money, but maybe he wasn't willing to spend as much. Maybe he he wasn't willing. And he looks at this dirt, and in Israel, it is hot and dry. We can relate. And the ground gets very hard. The dirt gets hard. And, and so this guy is thinking, well, I think this is probably good enough. This gets hard. And, and you know, and so, so he starts building and starts putting stone upon stone, and, and, and they're making their home there. He's probably, he's probably going a little faster than the guy who's still digging down in the bedrock, okay, because it takes some time and effort there. But, but he has something to show. And people can walk by and they can see one house that's already built and it looks good on the outside until it it does what? Rains. Until, and we're like, please, Jesus, just send it. We'll take it. We'll take it, right? But, But Jesus isn't talking about a drizzle. He's not talking about that. And what would happen in this climate is there would be, because the ground would be so hard, it would be difficult for the water when it would come down to absorb into. So this, uh, the ground and this, this, it would turn into these flash floods that would sweep everything and even people away. And this is what the imagery that Jesus is painting here. On the outside, the homes looked the same. You could probably talk to the builders and they would even sound the same But this is the thing that is interesting. It doesn't just drizzle or rain. Eventually the storm comes. The storm comes. The flash flood Jesus talks about. It happens. And Jesus is saying one home is going to be swept away. And one is attached to bedrock. Jesus is pointing this out. Um, uh, It's a storm. This is Hurricane Michael that came through the Gulf Coast in 2018. That is an ominous looking storm. That hurricane was a category five. That is catastrophic, right? I mean, it just destroys everything in its path. And do you know where that storm, do you know where it is in that image? Do you know where it's headed? Straight to Mexico Beach where LeBron Lackey and his uncle built their home. That is exactly where that storm is heading. And, uh, and, and here's the thing. They knew a storm was going to come. They had no idea how quickly it was going to come. They knew it was, was going to happen. They just didn't know that it was going to happen that quickly. And their home had just been built. And I want, you to, I want you to see kind of the aftermath. And I want you to hear kind of what happened there. So here's a quick video. Watch this video. 
After Hurricane Michael swept through the Florida panhandle last week, thousands of homes, of course, were destroyed. However, one home in Mexico Beach was left practically untouched by the storm. According to an article in the New York Times, the Sand Palace was built to withstand a hurricane like Michael. One of the homeowners felt relieved that his home is still standing, but said he also feels terrible for those who lost their homes during the storm. That we're so sad that these uh, people at Mexico Beach, wonderful people, that so many of them have lost everything. And so we're, we're glad for us, but yet we, there's not much joy when you, when you look at this. The owners wouldn't say the cost uh, or what the cost was to fortify their home, but tax records put the value of the home at $400,000. Mexico Beach was one of the hardest hit areas by Hurricane Michael. Yeah, I read an article about that guy in the, the home, and they pretty much took all the hurricane precautions and then doubled them throughout the house, so that's why. Wow, well, yeah. it worked at yeah. least, right? Yeah, so that's why the house looks like it hadn't even been through a hurricane hardly, so. Mm. But it's cost money to do it. I kept watching that, and he said, but it costs money to do it. And I thought, that's a great, that's a great statement, and it's very accurate, and it's very true. But I think the better statement would be, or the better question to ask would be this, but what does it cost not to? It does cost up front. It did cost. But you look at this, by the way, someone pointed this out to me in the last uh, service. There's a house that is directly behind that house that made it because of their house. But there's an application in that too. Because your decision, our decision to build a house that is, can withstand storms, others benefit in our lives. And this is what we know about storms. Storms are inevitable. They're going to happen. You're going to go through them. If you're not in one now, you've probably come out of one. Or you can see, oftentimes, the storm clouds gathering onto the horizon and you know that it's, it's just a matter of time. That's, isn't that just life? It is. You're going to go through a storm at some point or another. Here's what we also know about storms. They're unpredictable. You know, I was uh, this morning, um, I was looking at the storm that's happening in kind of Southern California area. And this is what I was reading about this. It's been 84 years since a storm like that has gone through that area. So nobody, probably two or three weeks ago, meteorologists included, were like, there's go we know there's a storm coming through. Meteorologists do their very best. We like to make jokes. They have computers. And I always kind of laugh at the computer models because it's like, this is what this storm could do. It could go here, 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 right? And it's like, <laughs> but that's what it says. They're un predictable and you will hear them I've, I've heard meteorologists say they have a they, storms have a mind of their own and so they do their best even with our technology but they're unpredictable and then and here's what we also know they come on suddenly right in Matthew chapter 8 we're in chapter 7 but if you were to go over to to the next chapter, Jesus tells his guys, his disciples, get in the boat. We're going to go across the lake. And then I want you to see something. He'd just been talking about storms in chapter 7. Jesus, Matthew 8, 23, then got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Go to the next verse. What does it say? What's the next word? Suddenly. Isn't that what happens? They come on. You don't see them coming. You get sucker punched by a storm. And, and a fierce storm struck. And in that area, these storms would come on suddenly because the, the, the lake or the Sea of Galilee, um, it's, it's here where there's a mountain range that is on the east. And the cool, dry air coming out of the desert and out of the mountains would collide with the Mediterranean moist air. And it would, a storm would happen suddenly. And they would get caught in these kinds of storms. But we also know this. Storms are impartial, which means that, that, that they don't pick favorites. They happen to all of us. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, they had heard him say, 
in the first part of the sermon, he says in chapter 5, he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Rain falls on all of us. That's what life is like, this side of heaven. It's not easy. Life is tough sometimes. And we, what he's saying is we're all going to go through storms. Being a Christian does not exempt you. If you follow Jesus and you build your house on of the foundation of Christ, it does not exempt you from storms. Jesus never promised a storm-free life. Jesus has promised to go with you and with me through our storms. He has promised us that. These builders, what do we know? They had dreams, the same dream. They heard the same message, the same word by the divine teacher himself. And, and they knew that storms were inevitable, that they were unpredictable, they're impartial. And what he is saying is, you've heard me say these things, so here is what I know. You're going down the hill in a moment. You have a choice to decide with everything that I, to do, what you're going to do with what I've just told you. You can build your home, your life upon these divine truths of what, what it looks like to follow me in the kingdom of God. Or you're going you're gonna to decide to take the broad road. And you're going to go through a storm. And you, you may look the same, but what's the difference? What's beneath the surface? What's beneath the surface Jesus is, we may say, well, what is the difference? We're like, well, the foundations. And, well, what about the foundations? That's true. The difference is the foundations. Well, one is solid and one is rock and one is sand. Yes, that's true. But what is Jesus getting at? He's saying the difference between the two. Go back to verse 24. I want to read it to you in the ESV, okay? And here's what it says. Everyone then, Jesus says, who hears these words of mine and, what's the next word? Does them will be like a wise man. So he's saying there's the difference of wisdom, someone who applies them, who built his house on the rock. And then if you skip to verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine, and you can see it clearly, and does not do them, is a man who built his house right on the sand. And this man will be a, and he uses this word, foolish. It's a choice. It's a choice of wisdom or foolishness. So here's what we know about these builders. Both builders have to make a choice. Jesus is saying you, you got to make a choice about what you're going to do. And some will choose wisdom. And it's going to cost up front. It's going to be difficult. It's going to put you on the narrow road as you go through that narrow gate. You're going to bear, you're going to bear fruit in your life as that kind of tree but then there are others that will be on the broad road. They make that choice. There will be others that will look like a tree, but they will not bear fruit. Jesus is saying this, this Sermon on the Mount. What, what kind of things is he, is he talking about here? Jesus is talking about, remember last week I talked about a lot of the themes you'll find in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in relationship with God, the vertical relationship with God. Not religion, but what it looks like for God to be king in your life. And for God to be king in your life means it's going to impact how you treat one another. And this is what Jesus is talking about. There's this impact. It's not all this religious, you know, um, activity that doesn't really change our lives. Jesus is going to talk about, remember the themes? Humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's going to talk about being humble and what that looks like. And he's saying that's a key to a rock-solid life. He's going to talk about reconciliation and, and forgiveness and, re and, and, and being willing to be a peacemaker. And he's, gonna, he's saying that's a key to a rock-solid life. But peacemaking's hard, right? It's not easy, okay? And, and you seek to live at peace as far as it depends on you. Not everybody's going to live at peace with you, but you do your part. And then, he, and then he begins to talk about these actions of love, not the gushy word love. We all can say it, but the actual actions of love that cost you something. It's inconvenient to go the extra mile. It's inconvenient to turn the other cheek. It's inconvenient. That's the Sermon on the Mount. It's this, and he's saying, blessed, happy, rock solid are those that make the choice to not just hear it and say, I love the message, Jesus. They say, I want to do something with this, even though it's difficult and it's costly. 
This is what he's saying, okay? Jesus is getting at this. One, Jesus calls wise. The other one, Jesus calls a moron. You're like, that is harsh, Pastor Bart. Well, it's because Jesus uses a word. The original language is moros. It's where we get our word moron. So I'm just being biblical, okay? All right? <laughs> but, but here's what he's saying. It's a moronic kind of way to live, to hear the truth and then just be like, I'm just going to walk away and just do my thing and live my truth, okay? And what you're going to find is your house is going to be easily swept away, swept away. He's saying, I want you to make a wise choice. The fool is not the person. This is important you hear this. It's not the person who lacks information. We have a vat of information today. It's not the, the person who lacks information. The fool is the one who does little or nothing with the information. And they hear it week after week after week, right? And they hear it all the time. But then their life really is not any different because they will choose not to apply it. And they go back into their relationships and they handle their everyday relationships like those who don't know Christ handle their relationships. Their marriages look not any different than those who don't know the love and grace of Jesus Christ in their life. The way they are at work is not any different than the way they are, you know, when they're up on the hillside next to Jesus. Or, you know, they're out the hillside. It's easy, isn't it, to say amen to something. The place that you get put to the test is when you walk out those doors. And this is what Jesus is saying. You all are hearing it. I'm glad you're hearing it. What Jesus is going to say, you have a choice to apply or not apply. And here's what Jesus would say. Both builders ex essentially because of their choice, experienced different outcomes. Both builders had a different outcome because of the choice. The choice to apply or the choice to just think it's nice, but I'm not going to do the, anything with this. I want you to go back to that image, if you will, of the house that lasted at Mexico Beach there in Florida. And I want you just to, that's the difference. I want you just to look, every time I look at that, it moves me. Because I realize how devastating storms can be. Can you see that? For people. And, 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 and the difference was one got prepared for the storm. Jesus said, Jesus said this in verse 27. When the rains, he, listen to the description. When the rains, notice when, not if. That's key. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, listen, to, it, it's, it's powerful. It will collapse with a mighty crash. The outcome of the foolish builder who chose not to apply the words of Jesus, he describes it as this epic collapse. They look the same on the outside. They look the same, right? But, but one was dug down deep. Well, what does the Lord want us to do with this? We have to ask ourselves. It's about application, not information, right? It's about transformation, not just being informed. What does Jesus want us to do with this? Well, you, if you take note of the text, you could drive by both houses and they would look the same. You probably couldn't tell the difference up front. If you were to talk to both builders, they probably would say a lot of the similar things. The only time you would be able to discover the difference between these two people, these two lives, their home, what reveals it? A storm. A storm, this is something for you to write down. The storms reveal our foundation. Storms show us what our foundation, our true foundation really is like. Storm has a, has a way, doesn't it? The storm of letting you know what kind of foundation your life is really built upon. And I wish that the Christian life, I wish I could tell you this, that it, if you follow Jesus, that it's going to be rainbows and ponies and storm-free and you'll never. But, but what I see right here is Jesus is saying it's, 
it's going to affect both people. Both people, the just and the unjust, the righteous, the unrighteous, are going to go through this. I, I wish I could tell you, like, and I'm just going to say this, okay? Like some, I, I'm not going to say a name, but like some televangelist will tell you. And they'll tell you, you come to Jesus and it's always going to be sunshine. Okay? And, and, and there's some teaching that, that goes on like that. And you know what that teaching will do? It will build a big crowd. It will build a big crowd. Come to Jesus and you're going to have healing for every single thing in your life. And listen, I want you to know something. I believe that Jesus can still heal today. So don't misunderstand me and go out saying, Pastor Bart doesn't believe in the miracles of God because I do. But I also know this because we've experienced this in our life and in our family is that sometimes God doesn't heal in our timing and in our way. But it doesn't mean he loves us any less. We need to understand this. Come to Jesus and you're going to have a, ooh, that was a good televangelist voice. You're going to have a big fat bank account. I wish I could tell you that that's the way it is. Oh, by the way, as you send your check in to us, come on now, you know, there's always kind of that catch there. And, and I will tell you that sometimes God will bless you monetarily, but the blessings are not always monetary. There are other kinds of blessings at life. There's a lot of short-sighted vision in this. I don't want, Jesus didn't want to build a crowd. This is what I feel compelled as your pastor to do. We want to build disciples. Disciples whose roots go deep into the foundation of Christ. So when the storm comes, and it will come, you're ready for it. You're still going to get hit by the storm. You're still going to experience this. Jesus says, I want you to make a choice about me and my words to do something with them as you follow me. And Jesus said right before this, it'll put you on the narrow road. It's not going to be easy. It's going to, what he's saying here, it's going to cost you up front. It's not always convenient to follow Jesus. Sometimes it's the hardest thing to make that choice because you know what he would talk a lot about in that same Sermon on the Mount? Persecution. Because when you follow me, Jesus would say, you, you very likely are going to even be persecuted for following me. Well, that will thin a crowd out. But these are the things that Jesus would say. It's important. We need to catch this. Jesus was calling them to faith in action. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that's where the foundation begins. But for us to follow Christ is how the foundation is strengthened. As we follow him into discipleship, salvation is free. It costs us nothing. It costs Jesus everything. Discipleship, though, is costly. And this is what he's saying. Foundations, this is another important thing to think of, must be formed before, before the storms come. Uh, back a few, several months ago when they were getting ready to pour foundations, this is going to kind of make you sick a little bit because it's going to make you want some of this. It kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. Do you know why? <laughs> because it kept raining. And I'd be like, when are we going to do this? You know, and you're like, bring the rain, okay. But back then it was raining and then it would get delayed. And, and here is what you need to know is foundations should be formed before the storms come. Uh, they would tell me back then, why, why didn't we pour the foundation? Well, you can't pour it in the rain. You can pour it before, you can pour it after, but you're not supposed to pour it in the rain. And, and here's the thing. There's wisdom in pouring it before the storm comes. You can pour it after the storm. A lot of times we learn from that, but it's really hard to pour it during the rain. And, and so here is, here is what Jesus is telling us. Prepare. Do something about it now. Don't wait for the storm. There's wisdom to do something about it now. I want to I kind of wrap this up with this final story. If you were to go from uh, Matthew, okay, over to Mark chapter 4. Remember how I said Matthew 8, Jesus got in the boat. Well, Mark 4 is the same story, okay. And he tells his guys, get in the boat. We're going to cross to the other side of the lake. Those are his words, and then they get in, they start going across, and Jesus goes to sleep, and then suddenly, Jesus takes a nap. He takes a nap, and he's got his head on a pillow, 
And then the storm suddenly hits, and these guys are starting, these seasoned fishermen are starting to freak out. Oh, my goodness. It was a storm probably like anything they had, they had never seen before. And they're like, I mean, they are like, what are we going to do? The water's coming over into the boat. They're sinking, taking on water. And uh, now here's something I want you to think about. They were right where Jesus told them to be. Think about this. And the storm still hit. That's something you need to think about. They couldn't be more in the center of God's will. They were with Jesus. And the storm still hit came. Jesus is sleeping and, and they're doing what most of us would do because when a storm hits, and you may be in a storm, maybe it's a financial storm, maybe it's a storm with your business, maybe it's a storm relationally, maybe your marriage is something brewing there or something going on with one of your kids. Those are one of the hardest storms to go through because you, you feel like you have no control at all, right? And but here's the thing. They start saying this, essentially, Jesus, don't you care? Have you ever felt like that in the storm? Don't you care about us? You're, the time we need you the most, you're taking a nap. This is, this is what they end up saying. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care that we're going to drown don't you care that we perish? And Jesus awakened, and he said, really, what seems like an insensitive question. He says, why are you so afraid? Because there's a storm, is what we want to say, and we do, and, and water's coming in, duh, you know. Why are you so afraid? And then he gets up at the front of the boat, and he says, peace, be still. Isn't it interesting that he doesn't say, storm, be still. I was thinking about this this week. Peace, be still. It affected the storm because it did stop. But maybe peace, be still was for them and for you in your storm today. I'm with you in the boat. That's what he's saying. Be still and anchor into what I told you. You say, what did he tell them? I'm going to get you to the other side of this lake. But here's what we discover in this is that the storm reveals what we really believe about what Jesus has already said. And this is what he's saying. Be still and trust me. Now I want you to see how that story ends. After this happened, they had trouble applying what they'd already heard him say. We have trouble applying what we've heard him say. And the promises that he has given, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. At first they were afraid of the storm, but now they have a fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. You may be like, what does that mean? We talk about it. It's an awe. And who is this man? Who are you, God? You're so awesome. Here's what fear of the Lord, Scripture tells us, leads to. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. To fear the Lord. This began to impact them in such a way. This, 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 they, they, they move from being listeners to applying this in their life. And we, it's easy, again, to say amen and hear uh, and, and to, to be a hearer. It's another thing to say amen out there in the storm. And this is what he's getting at. Hey, Danny, um, bring out my punching bag. Will you bring out my punching bag? All right. I had one of these as a kid. Um, and... Um, I also enjoy this as a pastor. I'm just like, no. Um, I, I, I've, I've printed out a face that I have put upon this thing, okay? Any, any ideas who that might be? Might be? Any? I would never do that to Randy, you guys. I can't even believe. In fact, I was going to yesterday, and my wife said, you need to be nicer to Randy, okay? And, uh, and so, I, so I didn't put anything on here. But as a kid, I love this. I love having this. And it is fun as a pastor. It's kind of stress relief too. But, but what, what do you do with these things? All right, well, you punch them. And then what happens? They come back. You got to get back or it'll punch you back, okay? But you punch them. They go down. 
and then they bounce back. You get sucker punched by life and, and it comes back. Why does it bounce back? Because there is something that is of weight that is in the foundation. If there was nothing in the foundation of substance, it would get punched and it would stay down. Which is what happens to those that don't have the foundation. But here is the thing. When your weight is the solid rock of Jesus and his words you apply... You're going to get sucker punched by life, but you do bounce back. And I, and I want you to think about this as we end this today. I, again, I wish I could tell you that life's not going to throw you sucker punches, but you would know I would be a liar because it will. You're going to go through storms, and the storms reveal what your foundation is made of. And so as we bow our heads, as we come before the Lord this morning, and as you think about what your foundation is today, Jesus said there are those who are wise and those who, who walk out and foolishly don't do something with the words that I have given them. So today, as we bow our hearts before the Lord, I want to ask you, with all the love in my heart for you as a pastor that wants to shepherd you and walk with you through storms of your life, what kind of foundation have you built your life upon? Is it, is it the sand? Is it the stuff that the world tells you will bring you satisfaction? It looks good on the outside. But when the storm happens, you find often that when you get knocked out by life, it's so hard to get back up. Or have you built your life on this solid rock, the words of Jesus you put into practice in your life that cost you up front? They do cost you. Salvation's free, discipleship's costly. Solid rock or sandy, sandy foundation, what is it for you today? Today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, that is where we begin constructing the foundation. And I urge you, if you've not trusted Jesus as your Savior, to put your faith in him. He came to forgive us of our sin, to make the way for us to enjoy not only heaven one day, which that's part of it, but to, to even have him in our lives as we walk through the difficulties today. And he just says, I'm here for you. But you need to put your faith in him. You have to invite him. He doesn't force his way into our lives. What we want to help you with today, if you put your faith in Christ, we want to help you begin to follow Jesus into discipleship. That's our role as your pastor's. And as this church, you might say something like this to him today. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. You are the solid rock. And I receive your gift of salvation today. Lord, be my savior. And I want to follow you as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Forgive me of my sin. Give me a brand new start. Lord, give me a rock in my life that I may build my life upon this, affecting not only me, but so many others in a legacy. The last thing I want to say is some of you, I know you're in a storm. And my prayer for you today is that you would sense the Lord's closeness to you, that he's with you in the storm and that you would receive that peace that he speaks over your storm, that you would be still. You would be still in his presence. Let him work on your behalf rest in him today. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. May we apply it. In your name I pray. Amen.